by year six. So we're going to read the next section of our book above pay grade, The Boy with the Bronze Axe by Kathleen Fiddler today. So in the last session, we read the beginning of chapter 10 and it was quite a sad beginning because Lokar died and he's also given a warning to Tenko and Bruno that something bad is going to happen to Scar, that the village is going to vanish and that there's going to be a great wind and some terrible weather and that they need to be ready and be aware. Now, as we finished that section, it finished with, the wind is rising, Bruno said. They listened. The sound had grown to a steady whine. So I asked you to have a think about what you thought was going to happen next. So we're going to find out in this next section of chapter 10, page 146 to 150 today. And as I'm reading, you might want to pause at this point and have a look at the Vipers questions below the video as usual. So you can see what's coming up and we'll go through the questions as I read. The thatch of rushes and turf that Bruno had laid over the jaws of the whalebone rustled and rattled as if a rat were among them. The pitch of the wind's whine grew higher. It sounds like a storm blowing up, Stempsey remarked. Tenko rose to his feet. I will go down to the beach and see that the boats are well pulled up. I'll come too and help you, Bruno said. When they reached the sand dunes, the wind whistled about their ears. The bent marram grasses quivered and rustled. The sea heaved and twisted, flecked with spume. It seemed as if the whole world was stirring, uneasy and menacing. They went down to the beach. The waves were breaking hard on the distant reefs and there was a heavy drag of shingle in the undertow on the beach. It was still low tide. Some instincts told Tenko to lift the boat to some other place instead of just above the high water mark on the beach. Let us carry them to the rocks that are close to the shore at the, the place where the stream of Skara flows into the sea, Tenko suggested. The tide never comes to those rocks. Yes, we will do that, Bruno agreed. It meant carrying the boats nearly a quarter of a mile to the south of the Bay of Scale. Tenko and Bruno bent their backs to the task. It was a grim struggle. The wind was blowing off the sea against them, a cold, biting wind that raised little scurries of sand and blew it into their eyes. That's our first question today. It says little scurries of sand. What does this phrase suggest about the sand? Have a think, little scurries of sand. So I think this phrase suggests the word scurry is usually used when we talk about insects scurrying about, running about. So it suggests almost that pieces of the sand are almost running across the top of the rest of the sand. And that suggests that the sand is moving quite quickly. Scurrying and scuttling is how insects move when they run very quickly. It's almost as if they're gliding along the surface, just like the sand appears to be doing now. But it's moving very quickly and it's getting blown into their eyes. Their lips were gritty and salty with the feel and taste of it. At last, breathless, they reached the rock well above the high water mark. There, in the shelter of the rock, they had a brief respite from the wind. Here there is a curved bite out of the rock facing the land. Let us put the boat here, Tenko suggested. They stowed the boat under the lee of the rock. Lift one or two big boulders, Bruno, and put them inside the craft. Why? Do you think the wind will blow it away? Bruno laughed. It would take a mighty storm indeed to lift a boat like this. There's no telling how far tonight's tide might reach, Tenko said seriously. Suddenly, Bruno remembered Lokar's words and felt uneasy. He helped Tenko to fill his boat with ballast. They made a second journey with the smaller boat. By the time they returned to the huts of Skara, the moon had risen and was casting a fitful light over the turmoil of the sea. Their faces were stung, were stung by the scouring sand as Bruno and Tenko fought their way back to the huts. There was a thin drifting of sand along the tunnel already. Callie and Stempsey will have plenty to do sweeping the sand away tomorrow, Bruno remarked. Tenko said nothing, but he cast an anxious glance backwards over the sand dunes. 
Already Stempsey and Callie and Brocken had gone to their stone bunks. Strange gusty noises came from the thatch. Tenko crept in beside Brocken but he could not sleep. The peat fire glowed a little more brightly than usual, as though the draughts along the tunnel would not let it sleep either. Tenko lifted himself up on an elbow, watching the fire and thinking of many things. The wind rose again. It seemed to Tenko as though wordless voices wailed to them from out of the sea. A shrill note rose above all the others, an undulating warning note. It seemed to summon up a sudden surge of sound. There was a roar of wind and sea and wild thunder. Suddenly it ceased and sank to just a murmur, fading almost to silence. Then once again there was a low stirring of sound, growing and growing, until it howled and shrieked in a turmoil. From the sea came a dull boom with an eerie echo among the reefs. Under the stone slab door to the tunnel was a gap. Through it drifted the sifting of sand. It twisted in tiny whirlwinds just inside the hut. The wind died to a sudden silence again. Tenko began to think the storm was dying away. Then all at once the wind rose in a mocking shriek. The sea answered, crashing in fury. The skirl of the wind mounted higher and higher. Like a blow from a mighty hammer, the wind hit the beehive roof of the hut and lifted part of the thatch and whirled it away. Everyone was wakened by the noise. Bruno sprang from his bed. What was that? The wind has taken some of the thatch, said Tenko. That's our next question. It's a retrieval question. What had woken everyone up? What woke everyone up? Have a think. So you would have thought it was the sound of the wind that had woken everybody up because it sounded as if it was really quite loud. The sound of the sea as well. But what actually woke everybody up was the wind had really picked up and it actually picked part of the thatched roof up and it whirled it away. And the noise that that made is what made what woke everybody up. The wind had taken some of the thatched roof with it. So the roof was partly blown off. Bruno surveyed, surveyed the damage. There's a big hole, but the whalebone frame seems firm. We shall have to do repairs tomorrow. Once again, the wind died down, only to rise to a sudden onslaught of fury. A small cloud of sand blew in through the hole and it fell upon the fire. It is the worst wind we have ever known, Stempsey said anxiously. The wind came funnelling through the hole, bringing another choking cloud of sand and scattering some of the smouldering peats. Tenko and Bruno ran hither and thither, stamping them all out. They could hardly see each other through the drifting sand. The whole stone hut seemed to quiver as the wind dealt its buffeting blows. The wailing note of the storm rose higher and higher, as though all the demons of the air had been let loose. There came another ominous crack from the roof. So that's our last question for this section. It's an inference question. There is mention of demons and shrieking and wailing and fury on this page. Why do you think the author has chosen this language? What is the atmosphere of this section of the book? Have a think. So all of those words are associated with hell. Demons and fury and shrieking and wailing. They mimic the sound of the wind, but what they are suggesting is that this is a hellish time, that it's menacing, it's threatening, it's intimidating. All of the things that might make people a little bit uneasy and anxious and scared. So the author is trying to set that atmosphere, set a mood of the panic and the fear that Tenko and Bruno and Stempsey and Callie and Brocken are going to be feeling in that hut that is gradually being ripped apart by the storm. There came another ominous crack from the roof. Quick, onto your beds, under the shelter of the walls, Bruno cried. They cowered under the beehive-like slabs of stone. The wind battered the remaining thatch, lifting it up and down. Then there came a terrible crash. Down into the hut fell the great jewels of the whalebone, bringing them with showers of sand. For a minute, the peats blazed up as the remaining thatch caught fire adding smoke to the whirlwind of sand. 
The family choked and spluttered, hiding their faces under their arms. The hut was now wide open to the storm. Even inside, the wind shivered and howled, bringing with it so much sand that it doused the fire. We cannot stay here, Stempsey said. I can hardly breathe. I will go and see if the folks in the other huts have fared any better, Tenko said, snatching up his cloak from the bed. He found drifts of sand along the tunnel passage into which his feet sank. When he reached the end, there was a drift that came halfway up the entrance. He squirmed his way through to the main passage. Even here, he could not stand upright for the drifted sand. In the meeting place, a small crowd of people had gathered, confused and frightened. How is it with you? Tenko asked. Our roof has been carried away. All the thatches have gone, Lemba told him. The houses are filling with sand. What are we to do, Tenko? I will go back and bring Bruno, Tenko said. There was a slight lull in the wind, so instead of going straight back, he made his way along the passage that led to the sand dunes. Tenko felt he had to see what was happening outside. He covered his nostrils with his sheepskin cloak and stepped from under cover. Even though the wind had dropped a little, the sand stung him pitilessly. It seemed as if the whole world was in motion. The sand dunes were heaving up and down like giant waves, piling up sand against the stone huts. Some drifts were level with the holes in the roofs, and the sand was pouring down into the huts below in a constant stream. A whole sandbank was threatening Bruno's house. Tenko saw what was bound to happen. There was no time to lose. He fought his way back along the passage. When he reached the tunnel to Bruno's hut, he almost passed it by. A drift was within inches of the top of the entrance. Tenko scooped aside the sand with his hands as fast as he could and worked his way on his hands and knees into the hut. Quick, quick, get out of here, he cried. The sand dunes are shifting and burying the huts. They are all on the move like the sea. You'll be buried alive if you stay. Even as Bruno and the others sprang to their feet, a stream of sand poured through the hole where the thatch had once been. It almost smothered them as it fell, spreading over the floor of the hut. Bruno seized Stempsey. Hold on to my tunic, Brocken, he shouted above the crash and thunder of the tempest above. Bring Kali Tenko. They dashed through the opening to the tunnel, climbing over a mound of sand. Tenko pulled Kali. When they reached the door, Kali gave a shriek. Something had seized her by the throat and it was pulling her back away from Tenko. Come on, come on, Tenko cried, tugging at her. I can't. My beads have caught in the stone. They're choking me. And that's the end of the section today. So the next time we read, we won't have any questions. We'll just read the end of this chapter and then it will be followed by chapter 11, read by Mrs Hill, so that we can finish the rest of this book. I wonder if Callie will escape. Hopefully they'll all get out alive.